Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Kim Kelly, and I am really excited to present and share with you the findings of a study that we have been doing for you know a number of years. Uh, the study is done with uh, Kun Huo from Western University and um, my colleague Alan Webb from University of Waterloo. So this study is really interested in looking at the effects on learning of uh, managers that are making investment decisions. Um, and we are looking at the effects of a hypothesis testing mindset and also the effects of a causal model. So of course the natural question is, well, what is a hypothesis testing mindset? And then what is a causal model? I'm assuming that uh, you can see my screen. Good. Thank you. All right, so causal models, um, I have a kind of a simple diagram or a simple um, depiction of a causal model. Um, it's a key component of performance management systems in many organizations. And in particular, the proponents of uh, balanced scorecard has uh, been quite a strong advocate of having a, a causal model uh, in uh, the system. And uh, an example of a causal model in the balanced scorecard setting is as such, you know, they would have multiple uh, metrics, you know, organized into multiple perspectives. And in this case, four different perspectives. And the way that causal model uh, is supposed to work is that it's supposed to link some of this uh, metrics, let's say from organizational capacity to internal business processes to metrics measuring customer experience and ultimately, you know, how that affects financial outcomes that we're interested in. And the idea behind the causal model is that because it depicts, you know, this various uh, organizational metrics in a cause and effect relationship, it helps to communicate the company strategy to employees, um, particularly to rank and file employees, because oftentimes, uh, people who are in the trenches have a lot of difficulty relating to summary financial metrics, you know, um, like uh, net earnings. How, how, how does my action, you know, as a rank and file employee affects, you know, something that is so aggregated at the financial level? And I think a causal model helps people see how their actions are related to this whole causal change that ultimately feeds into uh, the aggregated financial metric that the firm is interested in. So it's helpful to communicate strategies. It's helpful to promote um, actions by employees that presumably would be congruent with the firm's uh, strategy. Uh, and because it communicates this cause and effect relationships, and one of the main learning difficulties that people have in learning causal relations is the inability or the difficulty in learning laggard relationships, meaning that you know, if I do something and it affects the financial outcomes uh, 10 periods later, people really have difficulty learning that. Um, but if you mapped it out for them in a causal model, presumably this helps people to learn uh, better. And some prior studies have, you know, looked into this and they have found indeed, you know, it's great. You know, it really promotes uh, learning and uh, performance. Um, the issue, however, with uh, prior research of causal models is that sometimes, you know, and oftentimes it assumes that the causal model is accurate. It accurately depicts you know, this causal relationships. Um, and one of the thoughts that we had was, well, we know business environment change, right? And, and in some industries more so than others. Um, and what is the implication of the business environment changing? It means that, you know, an initially accurate model could now become inaccurate, right? Um, and then what happens, right? Um, there's a survey that was done by Chris Itner and Dave Locker back, I think, in 2003, and they found that um, companies really don't validate or promptly update their causal models, you know, 
And of course, the question is why? Why don't they do that? Sometimes it's you know overconfidence. Um, we were working with a company, and we wanted to test the effects of customer satisfaction scores on financial um, uh, performance. And I think one of the comment that the company made was, well, it's self-evident, right? I mean, duh. So sometimes it's overconfident. Sometimes they believe that it's so apparent, you know, you don't need to test it. Sometimes it's data issues. They don't have the data. Um, other times it's a skill set issues. I mean, it's, it's not easy to run statistical models to test uh, lagged causal relationships uh, uh, in the real world when the data is really noisy. Um, I actually like the paper by um, Melina and her colleagues. And this is a car paper in 2007. They had um, examined the implementation of a balanced scorecard in a Fortune 500 company. And in this particular paper, they actually went and um, test to see whether the causal models that was, sorry, the causal relationship that was in the model, was it accurate? And it actually found that no, it was not validated. But what is interesting is this statement that I put from the paper. They said, despite the reputation of causality by empirical tests, the company and its distributors expressed satisfaction with the DBSC, that's the balance scorecard. And then they plan to deploy it worldwide. So it's really fascinating. I mean, the causal relationship was not validated, you know, but they're they're happy with it and they're gonna go ahead and implement it. Um, so what they did was they actually went and asked and interviewed the, the people in the company and said, why, you know, and they found that they were using it to uh, promote a, a performance-based culture. They thought that the balance scorecard, despite it not being validated, it would enhance, you know, employees' perceptions of fairness, of the legitimacy of the performance metrics that's being used, you know, of the incentive system. So it was used not so much because you know it was uh, validated causally, but it was really used for other purposes. So this got uh, you know me thinking, and this was a while back, you know, in, about the effects of inaccurate models, right? And here I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the prior research on um, learning from inaccurate models, because, and I'm going to give, go a little bit in depth because I think it it really provides a stage for why our current paper is important, right? So what I think, you know, some prior research has shown is that a model, even if it's inaccurate, you know, it can guide active hypothesis testing and therefore it can actually help learning. So one um, nice paper is by Sandra Vera Munoz and her colleagues. And this is a car paper again in 2007, an experiment. So what they did was they had audited participants. Um, they are making recommendations to a hypothetical client. This is an online grocery delivery company. Um, and the recommendation is on whether to invest in employee training or operational technology. So two programs. Um, they give the participants benchmark data from six competitors that are investing in both programs, right? Then they have a two by two experiment. Uh, first variable is, you know, a model that describes how great this employment training expenditures are in terms of impacting earnings versus a no model. Um, the other variable is whether or not this benchmark data on competitors, whether it supports this link, you know, that ET is great, all right. Uh, one period setting, and this is important because it leads on to my, my follow-up study. Um, what they found is that one, and this is not all that surprising, when the benchmark data supports the model, that means the competitor's data does indicate that, yeah, you know, this model that says that ET is great, you know, it's correct, all right? Indeed, they found that there is more ET rec investment recommendation in the accurate model versus a no model. So accurate model, great, right? And not that surprising, right? Now, what I thought was interesting was when the benchmark data actually does not support the model, all right? Here, it actually means the model is inaccurate. You know, they say ET is great, but ET is actually not that great. What I thought was interesting was that there's actually slightly less ET investment, although statistically not significant, in the inaccurate model condition versus a no model. So what this suggests to me is that in, at least in a one period setting, having an inaccurate model doesn't really harm, you know, decisions versus no model. 
and in fact may slightly be better, although statistically not so. So this got me thinking that, hey, this is a one period setting, right? What happens if it's multiple periods and people get to learn from the inaccurate model that, hey, you know, the model is inaccurate, would they actually get better than when they had no model? And so that was my follow-up study uh, in 2010. And I used uh, MBA participants from Singapore experiment again. I asked them to allocate an R&D budget, all hypothetical, between two product lines, you know, ABC and XYZ. I'm great with uh, uh, names here. <laughs> so I gave them data from um, 20 prior periods, all right, that shows that R&D expenditure in XYZ um, is great. All right, it generates a return that is four times that of R&D expenditure in ABC, okay? Um, then I ran three conditions. Uh, in all three conditions, I gave them a very simplistic causal model. I told them, you know, you invest in R&D, it's going to get a lot of product, product innovations. Those product innovations ultimately is going to be great for your operating income. So I gave them a simplistic causal chain. In one condition, I did not give them any weights between XYZ and ABC. In the accurate condition, accurate weights condition, I told them, hey, you know, XYZ is four times better than ABC. In the inaccurate weights condition, I flipped it. You know, I tell them that, hey, ABC is four times better than XYZ. <laughs> okay. Um, then I ran this for 30 period, this multi-period experiment, right? And what I found was that interestingly, when you look at RD investment in XYZ, and remember RD investment in XYZ is the one that is great. I want them to invest loads in it. Um, R and D investment X Y Z, a even uh, when we talk about performance variability, uh, a reduction in performance var variability, and learning because we ask them questions about you know relative effects about Leggett relationships later uh, at the end of the experiment. I found that the accurate weights condition actually perform at the same level as the inaccurate weights condition, and better than the no weights condition. Now the effects are not that great in the early periods, which is just like Vera Munoz paper, you know. But in the later time periods, this is where all the effects, the positive effects of uh, accurate weights and inaccurate weights come in. So where does this lead us to? We kind of kind of got the idea that, okay, maybe this inaccurate model is not so bad after all, you know. Um, but, you know, there are still some unresolved issues. And what are they? And this is what my current paper speaks to. Number one, there is no change in the underlying model accuracy, which means that you know, in prior studies, the model is either always accurate or always inaccurate, right? Uh, number two, those people with the inaccurate model, they never had a situation where they had a positive experience with the model. Right? They were investing in according to the model, the model was accurate. They never had this positive you know, prior experience. And then number three, which is important, those prior studies that I just talked about may actually have inevitably prompted a hypothesis testing mindset, which is what my current, our current study is, focuses on. How so? Number one, with the nature of the participants that they use, and number two, the setting and the language. And I'll tell you why. So for example, very Munoz, they use auditors. We assume auditors are more skeptical than the you know, normal person. We hope they are. Um, so naturally, they may be more skeptical you know, of whatever models that you give them. Number two, the model that was given to these auditors, they were told that it's based on third party research using data based on a different type of company, online bookstores rather than online grocery companies. So this gives participants a natural pause, right? That, hey, maybe the model may not be that you know, accurate. So that's very Munoz. Um, Kelly, which is my paper, in the experiment itself, um, I actually, you know, when I did it, I wasn't, I didn't have the intent to create a hypothesis testing mindset. I just wanted to make sure people were not, did not do, you know, blindly think that the causal model was accurate. So I actually, you know, went and I went and told them, hey, you know, the company is still learning. That's number one. Um, you are free to experiment, you know. Um, and then in the accurate ways and the inaccurate condition, I actually told them the company thinks, but it's not sure. You know, so I think there's a lot of 
um, uncertainty that is built into the, the language to tell them that, hey, you know, you know, don't overly buy into this causal model, you know, which brings me to my current study, right? And my current study is trying to resolve some of these issues that number one, you know, maybe the underlying model accuracy will change. Number two, you know, in the inaccurate model condition, you know, you people, if accuracy of the model change, people should have some positive experience with the model prior. And number three, you know, is there a difference whether there is a hypothesis testing mindset versus no hypothesis testing mindset, right? Okay, so the current research study, um, as I said, we're interested in people's learning before and after a change in the operating environment. Okay, so what happens is in the beginning, all right, we have a causal model. If you are given a causal model, the causal model is accurate. It correctly describes the environment and the causal relationships in the environment. Uh, the manager, if he has a model, will implement the model and the data will show that the model is accurate and validated, right? Then there's gonna be an exo exogenous shock to the environment that changes the underlying causal relationships and dang, the model is no longer accurate, right? So now the manager has to learn and implement a new strategy, all right? So this is our, our setting. Our experiment is based, I'm, I'm describing the experiment first before I go into the hypothesis because sometimes I think it's easier that way. Um, so in my experiment, we had a between subject um, manipulation. One variable is, you know, we give people model, a model versus no model, you know, and I'll show you the model very shortly. And then the second um, variable is we prompt them to adopt a hypothesis testing mindset versus no, no explicit prompt, okay? And then I have a within subject variable where I have a number of periods where they are making decisions, you know, where the model is accurate, that's pre-change. And then I had a, a shock to the environment. And then I had a post-change where, you know, they are making decisions when the model is no longer accurately depicting uh, the environment. Okay, so that's the, the setting. Now I'm going to talk about my hypothesis, what we expect. Oh, sorry. I was going to show you the model manipulation first. Um, this is what the model manipulation looks like. Uh, I have three investment areas, area one, area two, area three. And I tell them that those people who had the model tell them that the current period investment in an, an area is going to improve the performance in that area. And then the performance in that area is going to improve future period net earnings. So I tell them there is a time lag. And then more importantly, I tell them that area three is now the most, has the most significant impact on future net earnings. Um, this is the pre-change. In the post-change periods, area two become more important, right? But in the pre-change period, this correctly depicts the underlying relationships between investment in each area and net earnings. Um, what does the HTM manipulation look like? In the HTM manipulation, people who got this prompt were told uh, this uh, uh, language. I tell them that hey, there could be potential changes in the environment. Um, please, if you should evaluate you know, any hypothesized relationships using actual data. So I'm prompting them, please look at the data, please evaluate the data against your hypothesis. And then I tell them, importantly, over time, this how evaluation may lead you to change your beliefs so I'm kind of prompting them that, you know, um, you can change, you know, your, 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 your understanding, you know, over time. Uh, this prompt appears three times during the experiment. All right. So my hypothesis uh, first is I want to talk about the learning before the change in the operating environment. The model, if provided, is accurate. All right. Okay. I have no model versus model. The blue line is my first hypothesis. It says that you know having an accurate model is better than having no model, right? So positive relationship, that's the positive effect of having an accurate model. Nothing surprising here, right? Because prior research has shown us that having an accurate model is helpful, reduces con cognitive complexity, uh, et cetera. Um, then I have the red line. So the blue line is when there is no hypothesis, hypothesis testing mindset prompts. The red line, all right, just make it a little bit lower, but you know, it could be the same. 
The red line is uh, when there is hypothesis testing mindset. Here I'm kind of predicting a null. I'm predicting that the HTM doesn't really change the relationship, the positive effect of having a causal model. Now you may ask me why. Our thinking is that the HTM prompts them to evaluate the data critically, but if the data matches with the model, it shouldn't change the efficacy of the model, all right? So that's why we think that the HTM is not going to change the relationship. Um, well, then what happens in the learning after the exogenous shock, all right? Okay, this is the learning after the change in the operating environment. Now, remember, the model is no longer accurate. Uh, the model is inaccurate. So what we're predicting is there is a negative effect now of having a now inaccurate model, all right? Now, this is actually a departure from Kelly 2010, right? Because Kelly 2010 and Vera Minos seems to suggest that, hey, you know, there is a positive effect of the inaccurate model, right? But remember that, you know, in Kelly 2010 and Vera Munoz, these people had no prior positive experience, right, with an accurate model, right? So we believe that the inact just because of that positive experience with the accurate model, it actually may end up tempering their learning of new relationships. Um, it actually makes them difficult to see relationships and detect relationships that departs from the model, which they have previously implemented accurately and bought into you know, for the past uh, uh, few periods. So that's why we predict a negative effect of the now inaccurate model. Then after that, what about if you add HTM, if you prompt them, you encourage them to adopt a hypothesis testing mindset. This is where we think that the HTM will mitigate. It will weaken the negative effect a little bit. So in some sense, the red line rep represents the Kelly 2010 and the Vera Munoz et al. world where you're encouraging people to adopt a hypothesis testing mindset and therefore it mitigates some of the negative effects of an inaccurate model. Okay, so these are our two sets of uh, hypotheses for learning before and learning after change. Uh, the experiment, um, I already mentioned, we have got model versus no model, HTM versus no HTM. Those are between subjects, uh, manipulations. Then I've got people working through 48 periods. Some of them you know, are pre-change, that means the model is correct. Some of them are post-change, the model is inaccurate. I, uh, we recruited 203 participants on AmTurk. They were pre-selected from uh, an initial filtering survey of about you know, 1,340 participants. Uh, we uh, screened them based on financial literacy. We screened them based on you know, the, the accounting statistics and business education. Um, we got about 40% female, not surprising, more males just because it's AmTurk. Um, and, um, average is 35 years old, 13 years of full-time work experience. None of these demographic variables matter when we enter them into our uh, regression analysis, all right? Okay, timeline of the experiment, what it looks like. I have people exposed to the model and the HDM manipulations, if applicable. Uh, they review a historical data, 15 pre-task periods of the three investment areas and the earning data. This historical data is common to all conditions. And this uh, 15 pre-task periods, we, they will show that area three investment, you know, is the best, all right? So it's consistent with the model. And then I have 48 periods where they're actually making, the participant is making investment allocations. Um, and period 17 onwards is when there is an exogenous shock to the environment before periods uh, 17, so period one to 16, area three is great. Uh, after period 17, all the way to the end of the experiment, area two now is the best, all right? Um, I have a HTM prompt, as I said, right at the beginning when the task was described to them. Then I have those people that are in the HTM condition will get two additional prompts, one in the middle of the pre-change periods, and then one in the middle of the post-change periods. 
then, you know, because I was worried that they didn't realize that, or rather, let me pull it back and say, in the real world, if underlying cause and relationships change, likely that indicate indicators in the environment that cues in the environment that would suggest to them that, hey, something changed, you know, please, you know. And so that's what we kind of want to um, replicate a little bit. So we had a message about a competitor entering the landscape, you know, uh, two periods before the change. And then again, you know, another message about a competitor um, doing quite well, you know, um, uh, two periods after the change. So this is what the timeline of the experiment looks like. Um, this is what the task looks like uh, in or the investment allocation page look like. They have a budget of $35 million. They're supposed to allocate between three areas. Okay. In the investment allocation page, I thought there, there are some things that, you know, you might find interesting. One is we have a little box that they can click tasks and business model that they can click to review the task instructions or the model slash HTM manipulation that we gave them earlier if they want to, all right, so they can click on that. Uh, they can also click on this button called Pass Data. When they click on it, I'll show it to you what happens. Uh, it will show them first the table of data, all the prior period data. And then if they click on View Graphs, it will change this table into graphical format, just in case, you know, some people don't interpret tabular data, they may interpret graphical data a little bit better, all right? So the Pass Data will, uh, enable them to look at the tabular format and the graphical format of their past investments. Um, and then um, I had earlier indicated that there were two pieces of news about competitors. Um, once those news has passed, once those period has passed, um, the they, this buttons actually appear at the bottom of the investment allocation screen where they can actually click to review those um, those news again if they want to. Okay. All right. Um, so our dependent variables and our process measures, uh, we are interested about learning. And learning is captured by the amount of the investment budget that's allocated to the most profitable area. And just you know, to, to remind us again, the most profitable area changes. All right. It is area three in the pre-change periods, but area two in the post-change periods. We also have some process measures. Remember that pass data button? So we actually um, um, record the number of times they click on this uh, pass, uh, sorry, the number of times they click on this task button to look at task instructions. Uh, we also record the number of times they click on this table and the number of seconds they view this table. We then also record the number of times they view this graph and the number of seconds you know, time that they view this graph, all right? So those were the process measure, tasks, table views, table time, graph views, graph time, all right? Results, that's what you're interested in, right? Okay, so um, quite um, a lot of stuff, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through. Remember, investment in area three is the most profitable area in the pre-change period. It changes to area two in the post-change period, all right? Those lines, are the investments. We kind of average it out by eight blocks, uh, uh, chunks of eight blocks to just make it easier on the eyes. Um, the, the blue line to the left of it depicts the pre-change period, to the right of it depicts the post-change period. Okay, let's take a look at area three. Okay, investment in area three. Now, pre-change, as I said, area three is the best. All right, so to the left of this blue line, the first hypothesis is that accurate model is fantastic, right? So what you, I want you to look at is the blue line, no model condition, all right, versus the green line, which is the model condition. And indeed, people with the accurate model, they were investing more in area three, right? So the first hypothesis is kind of, oh, it's great, all right? We'll test it formally, of course, you know, but just we're just looking at the picture to see that it makes sense. And then after the second hypothesis is that pre-change, if you were to add HTM, it doesn't change the positive impact of the accurate model. All right. So here what I want you to look at is the red line, 
All right, the no model is the HDM and the purple line. The purple line is the model plus the HDM. And again, there is a positive relationship or positive impact of having an accurate model, all right? Even when we ask people to adopt a hypothesis testing mindset. So that hypothesis also seems to be consistent at least with the descriptive statistics, right? Okay, then what about post change? What happens when the environment changes? Now, we notice that overall, people are decreasing their investment in area three. And overall, post change, people are increasing their investment in area two, right? So people are not dumb, they're not stupid, you know? They, they get it that, you know, area three should be coming down and they get it eventually that area two is, is, is uh, uh, more important. But let's take a look at their learning, relative learning of the different conditions in the post-change period. Okay, so we're gonna kind of move over to this chart on the left and we're gonna focus on the area that is to the right of the, um, of the graph, of the blue line, sorry. Now, again, what I'm suggesting in the hypothesis is that the model is not inaccurate, it's actually bad, right? And so I want you to look at the blue line, which has no model. This is investment in area two. We want it to be huge, all right? And then I want you to compare it with uh, <clears throat> the, I want you to compare with the green line, which is those folks with the model. And lo and behold, the green line is below the blue line, which means that people with the model condition are having a greater difficulty increasing their investments or learning the area too is most important, okay? Um, so that some, somewhat supports our hypothesis that there is a negative effect um, of the now inaccurate model uh, when the, the model becomes inaccurate uh, in a setting where there is no HTM prompts, all right? So that's our other hypothesis. Then after that, our uh, last hypothesis was that, hey, if you have the model, I know the model is terrible, but if you encourage them to adopt a hypothesis testing mindset, it's gonna mitigate some of this negative effects. So I want you to look at the green line, which is bad because it's model, the model's bad in the post-change period. And I want you to compare it against the purple line. The purple line has you know, uh, the HTM that is tacked onto the model. And lo and behold, yes, you know, it mitigates it. It just moves it up closer. Uh, uh, um, and it increases area two investments. So generally the descriptive statistics look like they are consistent with you know, our, our hypothesis. Now we're gonna test it formally uh, using random effects regressions. I know huge, huge table, you know, a lot of data, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, I've got uh, the various dependent variables, you know, area one investment, area two investment, area three investment. And then I also had, you know, net earnings, you know, um, and then uh, the random effects regressions, basically I am including for every participant 48 periods of uh, data, right? Because they're making investment allocations, 48 periods. I make the individual, uh, the random effects, just to cap capture the repeated uh, measures that comes from one individual, all right? Uh, what is in the model? Um, I want you to kind of pay attention to, let's see, the dependent variables, all right? The dependent variables I have, uh, first I have model HTM and then model times HTM, all right? These three variables capture the effects of the model and the effects of HTM and its interaction in the pre-change periods when the model, if it exists, is accurate, all right? Then I have change, you know, in the model, um, change is coded as zero if the observation is from a pre-change period and coded as one if it's from a post-change period, all right? And then after that, I have all the interactions um, with the change variable, change times model, change times HTM, change times model times HTM. Now, this four variables that has the change in front of it, this captures the effects of the model and the HTM and the interaction in the post-change periods, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at the formal test of the hypothesis. And in the pre-change period, when we're capturing learning during the pre-change period, 
we want to look at area three investment because area three is the best, right? So here, what I find is that for area three investment, the model uh, variable is positive and significant, all right? And this is two-tailed P. So this means that people who have the model are investing more in area three, all right? Supports our hypothesis, all right? Um, and then B, uh, uh, beta three, B three model times HTM is not significant. This means that adding the HTM, all right, doesn't change the positive effect of the model. So H2A is supported, okay? Then after that, the effect of change for area three is generally negative as we expect. People realize that area three is no longer the most important in the post-change period, and therefore they decrease their investment in area uh, three. Then let's take a look at area two, which is now the most profitable investment area post-change. Now, what we found is that the coefficient for the change variable is positive. That means that post-change, people in general realize that area two is now the most important. So they're increasing their area two investment. So that's why there's a positive effect. Now to test H1V, what we did was we looked at the coefficient for change times model, and that one is negative. So this means that if you have the model, all right, you are actually investing less all right, in the post-change period in area two. So in other words, we're inferring that the ability to learn the area two investment is now the most profitable is impaired uh, by the model. Uh, we also actually found that, you know, those folks who um, just had only HTM prompt without the model, uh, they also similarly suffer. Uh, in the post-change environment where they are investing less uh, in area two. Then after that, what we found was that when you combine the model with the HTM, it's actually positive, which means it mitigates some of the negative effects. Having HTM mitigates some of the negative effects of having the model. And that's the reason why this is positive and significant, all right? So a natural question that uh, you may have is, well, if they are not, if these folks are not investing, the model folks and the HTM folks, if they're not investing in area two, then where are they investing in? You know, clearly, you know, they must be either investing in area three, which we don't see any significant effects or area one, which in our data, it does show that, you know, instead of investing in area two, which is the most profitable, they actually ended up raising their investments in area one, all right? So the other data that I thought that you may be interested in is the process measures to see whether people are behaving in the way that we thought that they would when we um, gave them a hypothesis testing mindset prompt and also when we gave them the model. So for that, we look at, um, remember I told you that um, we capture the number of times they click on the tasks uh, uh, button in the resource allocation page. We captured the number of times they uh, viewed the table, the number of seconds they viewed the table, the number of times they click on the graph, the number of seconds that they remain on the graph page. All right. So what we did here was we did a simple test, all right, to look at the effect of HTM. Okay. We want to see whether the hypothesis testing mindset prompt changes um, the way they view data, all right? So first thing we did was, you know, we look at the no model conditions and we see whether in the no, mo no model conditions, when people had no model and you encourage them to uh, do HTM, what happens? So you're comparing basically across uh, this uh, uh, two columns, all right? And what you will notice is that the HTM, as we expected, increases the number of times people look at the data, all right? Whether it's in the number of times they click the data or the number of seconds that they actually spend on the page, all right? And this is as we expected, right? Because we told them that, you know, you should be evaluating the 
whatever hypothesis that you have, you should be evaluating against actual performance data. So they are behaving like what we told them to. That's for the no model condition. In the model conditions, you know, that's when everybody had the model, we found the same thing, right? That when you're comparing table views, table time, graph views, graph time, folks who have the HTM are just viewing and looking at the data a lot more than folks who don't have the HTM. So what we kind of got away from this was that, yes, HTM works as what we thought it would work. They motivated people, they encouraged people to look at the data more, all right? Now your question to me will be, so it's all about looking at the data more, right? <laughs> if they look at the data more, they're gonna do better, right? And I'm gonna say, no, the reason is because if you remember, you know, the no model HTM conditions, in fact, they look like the ones that are looking at the data the most, right? I mean, you compare with all the conditions, they have, you know, the highest number of clicks, the highest number of seconds looking at the data, but these are the folks that did the worst, you know, in comparison to the other conditions. So it's not just about looking at the data, right? Then what is it about if it's not just looking at about the data? Then we want to look at the effects of the model, right, on view, data viewing, which is on the next page. Um, so same thing, all right, same variables, except that now, you know, I'm comparing the effects of the model. So first thing I did was, you know, we held constant HTM, right? Those folks, all those folks all have HTM, but we want to compare um, the folks that didn't have a model versus the folks that have a model, all right? So actually, it's the same exact data set as I'm rearranging, you know, uh, uh, the cells. Okay, I want you to take a look and see. Actually, I know that this one is not statistically significant at two tail uh, levels, but they're all in the same direction. Meaning that when you have HTM and when you have the model, it actually reduces the number of times and the viewing of the data. So yes, HTM does improve or does increase viewing of the data, all right? But when you have the model, it actually causes you to review the data slightly, just slightly less, all right? However, when you have no HTM, all right, and you look at the effects of the model, there is no significant effect at all. Meaning that when you have no HTM and you give people the model, the model doesn't change the way people view data. So what we infer from this is that if you want people to do well, it is not just about making them view the data more. It is about making them view the data more in relation to a model. And that model potentially could discipline them, could potentially make the viewing of the data more efficient. You know, and as a result, you know, we do see increase in viewing of data, but actually less relative to a no model setting where they have you know nothing to guide them right no structure to guide them at all so in summary this is our study we look at how a causal model affects learning and decision making and we want to see the effects of that causal model when it changes from being accurate to inaccurate when there's a change in environment our summarized results is that during the pre-change period Having an accurate model versus no model is great, right? It's fantastic, improves learning. Um, and when you encourage a HTM, all right, it really doesn't impair learning, all right, in the pre-change periods. However, during the post-change periods, this is after people has had experience, you know, investing in the model, you know, and uh, either in accordance to the, to the model that was given to them, or in accordance to the model that is in their heads, right? Okay, so here anyway, we found that having an initially accurate model provided to them that now becomes inaccurate, it actually impairs learning. And what we found is that when we encourage a HTM with the model, it mitigates some of this impairment. Contributions of our study, um, we think that it does qualify the conclusions reached by prior research on the efficacy of having inaccurate models. Um, you know, we we do we do we do 
thing that it shows that if you have a, you know, if you're vested in the model, especially if you have been given it, you tested it, you validated it, and then now the model changes, um, that potentially can impair your ability to uh, learn new things. Um, we did, we examined an intervention, a simple intervention, a HTM problem. We found that it was useful in mitigating some of the negative effects. So overall, I think we hope that we are advancing the literature on the development and the use of causal models in organizations. So with that, you know, thank you very much um, for your time and your attention. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Kim, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, now, uh, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your coach. Is Adam? Uh, please open your mic and ask your questions. <coughs> Great, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Uh, neat paper. Uh, I posted my questions in the chat, um, and you know, uh, just a bit outside the scope of your study, but I was wondering if you could share a bit more about uh, other downsides of HTM, and and maybe the practical implications of firms mucking around with HTM because it, it looks like uh, it can be good, it can be bad, and um, and so if I was a manager, what 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 do I do, uh, and what can I do as, as it relates to HTM? Um, any thoughts on, on those lines? Yeah, I mean that's an awesome question and. Um, and I say awesome because, you know, our reviewers ask the same thing. <laughs> and um, one of the, the key questions was, you know, your, the way we um, implemented the HTM was um, a very measured, you know, uh, tone. You know, uh, we did not um, give them a, what we call a directional, you know, HTM. We did not tell them, please actively think about how your you know, firm's causal model could be wrong. You know, I mean, we did not kind of prompt them that. Instead, it was just very neutral um, um, HTM. And we did that because we, exactly along the same lines uh, as you thought, Adam, we, we thought that, hey, if the model is accurate, you don't want them mucking around with the model, you know, you don't want them going around, you know, oh my God, the model is inaccurate. I'm just going to anyhow, you know, experiment. It's, it's going to be disastrous. You want people to kind of fall in line, you know, and buy into your strategy, right? You don't want them to kind of be constantly questioning you and, you know, testing your strategy. I mean, that would be disastrous. So we thought that, hey, you know, because of this, we didn't go down the route of trial literature that have, that was used in the audit literature, where they actually asked the auditors to actively think about, you know, why the client's explanation, you know, is wrong. You know, we did not go down that route. And to that, uh, to in response to your question, therefore, I think it's really up to future research, I think, to examine, you know, we think that it, it could be harmful if you, if you um, ask them to too actively, you know, question the model, right? Um, that said, in a pre-change period, if the model is accurate, However, in a maybe, you know, in an industry where the changes are so often so quick, you know, and you want people to be really creative, maybe there is a lot of the post change periods sort of dominate, right? And in that, in that setting, maybe a stronger HTM manipulation where you're asking them to constantly challenge the status quo, maybe that would work, you know have a stronger effect in the post-change periods. So long answer to your question. I think um, the future research still has to test the boundary conditions of this HTM uh, manipulation and see you know, in, in what type of industries would you know, a stronger or weaker HTM works. You know, and, and, um, but I think you know, that's a great question because you know, we, we, we did think about it quite carefully to make sure that you know, it, it doesn't, muck up the the, the pre-change periods with our HTM manipulation. I it just add, I, I think it's fascinating uh, what you find in terms of the, the harmful effects of HTM. I think it we, we tend to think professional skepticism, hypothesis testing, these are good things. Let's, they almost equate it to employee engagement. Uh, but it seems like if I understand your uh, your post period correctly, HTM actually leads to 
worse learning when there is no uh, causal model. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. So it, it's actually the worst outcome uh, to have this this high HTM. And so I, I think that's fascinating for maybe future research to, and obviously not this study, but for future research to understand that downside of HTM. That's neat. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we we don't emphasize a lot in our paper um, the solo effects of HTM. And you're right, when you look at the regression models and when you look at the descriptive stats, the HTM alone condition, when you know you're, you're asking them to really you know question and test the data and you don't give them a scaffolding to guide them, um, that really is the worst condition. We also look at, uh, uh, incidentally, we, it's not in our paper because eventually we took it out because the paper was so, became so big. Um, we actually also look at the variance um, of investments, you know, like how variable, you know, it, presumably if they're testing hypothesis, they're changing their investments a lot, right? And we found that, yeah, you know, the HTM alone condition, those were the folks that were, um, it was highly there. I mean, it was more, the variance was higher, you know, compared to the other conditions. So clearly they were testing. Hi, Steve. You have your hands raised. Yes, I do. Good morning, How are you? Kim. Very what? good. Can you show me what uh, your causal model looks like again? Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's see if I can, oops. Mm. This is a test to see how good you are at flipping between slides. Well, clearly not very well, Steve. Uh, so, are you actually able well, to see my screen? Well, yeah, I can see it. What okay, is causal about this? What is causal about it? Yeah. Um, okay, so a couple of things. One is it depicts, you know, the well, I guess it depicts a, a relationship between a cause and an effect. So the cause would be the investment, and then the effect would be uh, the net earnings. So that's one. So a causal model has a few components. One is you're telling people what is the cause and what is the effect, one. Two is you're telling people also the direction of the relationship, whether it's positive or negative whether it's linear or non-linear, that means the structure of the relationship. In this case, obviously, we really simplify it. So, and it's a fairly apparent positive relationship. Okay, so the variables involved, as in cause and effect variables, the relationship or the direction of the relationship, which in this case is positive. And then the third component of a causal model that is often talked about is the relative effect sizes between different uh, independent variables. So, you know, um, uh, variable A has a bigger effect on the outcome variable than variable B. So that is also part of a causal model. And in this case, we kind of did a simplistic, um, um, a very simple, uh, 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 depiction that you know uh, investment in area three has a higher weight, a higher beta coefficient, so to say. And then the other component of causal model that is at least described in the balanced scorecard literature is this idea of a legged relationships, and which kind of just want to tell people, and this is true in our setting um, that the investment, it does hit the net earnings two periods later. And so if people are not attuned to this lagged relation, it really is hard for them to learn um, the relative impact of those three areas. So that's um, how we, we portray you know, causal relationships. I think I know where you're going with this though, Steve. <laughs> you may. Uh, but all I can see here is that uh, to summarize your causal model is uh, you learn about time lag and you learn about the response coefficient on investment area three. So that is a very confused way of presenting that information. So 
what I see in this model is a lot of noise. This is not a causal model that is actually helpful to the decision maker because it suppresses what needs to be learned. And the idea of a causal model is to actually highlight the causal relations that may otherwise not be apparent to subjects. And right. so when I look at this, I say, oh my God, what am I disposed to learn from this? Because on the surface, it says uh, financial investment will have a future performance uh, and with a time lag, and then there will be another time lag and we'll get future net earning. Well, mm -hmm. gee, that and 450 will buy you a Starbucks coffee in Canada, maybe 350 in the United States. But so I'm, I'm having a problem uh, mm -hmm. with under, understanding, and this is getting back to Adam's point which is uh, what is the role of HTM here? And indeed, if you go to your lovely graphic of results, and that's another point that Adam was making, if you look at your graphic of results, it seems to me that my conclusion would be just looking at the graphic is, is that uh, the best thing to do here is not to have a model. At least in the post change period. Okay, so I guess if you- so, But, but the, the, there's nothing different in the pre-period. Those are basically uh, in the pre-period, there are mm, no, no, no substantive differences. And so this gets back to my point about the model doesn't actually highlight anything, it causes confusion. And okay, so the red line here seems to be governing. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, one is you mentioned that the um, model doesn't really help in the learning. Um, and so all that it's, you know, doesn't provide sufficient information. So in response, I think, I mean, I think that's a good point, you know, because in reality, it is a complex set of relationships uh, to learn, although not as complex as the real world. It is simple in an experiment setting, um, but it does bias against us finding results for the positive effect of the causal model, right? So to the extent that the model is, you know, really crappy and it doesn't really help, I think that it biases against us finding positive effects. And when you look at the uh, results, I mean, I know that you say that in the post change period, it's true, you know, it probably if you don't muck around, you know, it's the best. But really in the pre change periods, when the model is accurate, it has a positive effect. All right. So that means if the model is accurately depicting the world, having the model is actually better. So the green line, it is better than the blue line in the pre change periods. Now, in the, the post-change world, right? Yes, I agree with you and Adam. I think that the, having the HTM and having the model and it's, it's crippling, you know? And I think that is the whole point of our, our research, isn't it? That the, the fact that having a model actually is a lot worse than having no model at all. And it could be a bunch of stuff, you know? It could be that they were anchored on their prior investments, you know. Um, it could be that maybe they were already, you know, investing a lot in area two because they weren't doing as well anyway in the pre-change periods. So that's why the change is not as significant to them. So to that extent, that's the reason why we uh, have a um, we control, you know, using our random effects regression, we actually control for the degree of investment in a particular area pre-change. Because what we're interested in is capturing the change and not so much, you know, um, their level, you know, in the post-change world. So I guess that's the, so it, I mean, I think, I, I agree with you that it is, 
not an easy relationship to learn and the causal model is simple. So to that, I agree. Yeah, but the, my point is, is that you've made a simple relationship complex to understand. And that is not the goal of causal models. The goal of causal models is to make complex relationships understandable so that people will be able to act on the insights. You've done the opposite direction. You've taken a simple causal model and made it difficult to understand. And so hence, I don't know what one learned if one flips the notion of what a causal model is supposed to achieve. So maybe you and I should do a study together, Steve. And see whether if we kind of you know change the change the way the uh, uh, causal model is implemented, how that that affects learning. You have lots of questions in the chat box, so we should get these people in. Mohammed, yeah. how are we doing? How are we doing on time? Yes, um, now it's 6 uh, p.m. Uh, Cairo time. Uh, there is, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your questions. Uh, I think Aaron, you have a question? Please open your mic and ask your question. Aaron? Yeah, hi, this is Aaron. Uh, just curious, uh, was there a certain econometrics program that was used to kind of build and test this model? What um, it seems more complex than just most of what's available to most people through Microsoft or Google Sheets. Um, so do you mean as in us uh, in on the back end when you when we are analyzing the data? Yeah, any kind of econometrics programs that you may have used? Yeah, um, well, uh, my, my co-authors use Stata um, and we went, you know, state, so either Stata or SAS would be able to run random effects regressions. Um, and if you organize the data in such a way where uh, it's grouped by participant and then if you have the, uh, uh, the periods again, you know, categorized by a dummy variable where it's pre-change versus post-change, um, the random effects regressions within Stata and within SAS uh, uh, should be able to uh, test uh, the effects. Oh, but I think, I don't know whether you meant as in the actual relationship between the investments and the earnings. Um, for that, uh, the software program that we use to run the experiment um, actually uh, spits out the net earnings uh, based on um, based on a equation that we put in there. And the equation is literally, you know, the net earnings is, you know, 1.4 times, you know, the uh, R&D investments in, sorry, the investment is area one and, you know, 1.2 times investment in area two plus 1.4 times investment in area three. So the software program in the back actually uh, takes the investments from the participant and then spits out the net earnings to be displayed to the participant. Okay, perfect, thank you. Are there other questions? Please, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. I think, uh, can who, you have a question? Uh, sorry, I was just trying to respond to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, I'm, I don't have a question. Yeah. Uh, Hong, Bennett Hong, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, hi, Kim. My name is Bright. I find the study very interesting. Um, I think my question kind of related to Steve and Adam's earlier comment. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have, uh, what are your thoughts um, on uh, making learning uh, this variable um, as investment in area two minus investment in area three. Uh, so post uh, versus um, before the change. And um, if I understand the results correctly, it seems that um, 
the no model, no HTM condition, um, pre uh, change, they're the worst and post the change, uh, they're the best. So it seems like, um, so I just wonder what are your thoughts on um, why uh, they're doing the best post the period. And if we consider their uh, pre-period learning, it seems like their learning is uh, the largest in this condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we did, so your suggestion was, you know, the change, I guess, the um, dependent variable, that was one of your suggestions, right? Which was to take area two, uh, I guess, minus area uh, three. Um, and we kind of, we did multiple different permutations, you know, using different types of operationalization of the dependent variable. And uh, largely the results don't change all that much. Um, and uh, the other, the only thing that I would say is that the reason why we focus on area three investment and area two investment is because uh, of the unique setting of this study is that the, the, the underlying causal relationships change. So that would mean that the um, net earnings or even a, a variable that you suggested, which is error two minus error one, would change even if the participant did not do anything at all. That means if they kind of literally, if they not, did not change their investment allocations, which is equivalent to presumably no learning, let's say, you know, the uh, using a net earnings variable or using a variable that, you know, you suggested would have actually, there will be changes in that variable, which doesn't match with the fact that there is actually no learning happening. So it's a little bit noisier with those alternative uh, variables. Um, but, uh, and that's the reason why in the end, we, we chose to focus only on area three and area two. Um, but, you know, I think your point uh, is, is valid in the sense that we do always have to consider, you know, the, um, in a setting like this, we have to control for the amount of investment in that area, even pre-change, right? It's the change that matters. It's not, it's not the, um, the level, right? It's the change uh, when they go from the pre-change period to the post-change period, which is what our random effects regression takes care of. Thank you. Um, and also, um, I just find the result very interesting. Um, the no model and the no HTM condition, it seems like uh, post change, they invest the most in area two. Uh, what, what is your interpretation on that? Yeah, I think two things. Why? So yeah, that's what, again, two things are happening. One is I think before this, they were probably investing in area two more than uh, the other participants. Or, you know, at the very least, they are not um, as invested in area three. And so maybe that's one particular reason, all right? They are investing already more in area two. Um, the other reason could be what I think some of you have indicated is that they didn't have the, um, they didn't have the, uh, HTM to muck around with them that much, you know, they're not, you know, they're not as, as jumpy, you know, um, and when we did the variance analysis, that is actually the case, they, they, uh, when I say variance analysis, I mean the variances and analysis of the variances in investments in the no H, no model, no HTM conditions, that conditions tend to have less variance, that means they're changing their investments from period to period to a lesser extent. And maybe because it's because they don't have, they have no HTM, you know, to prompt them. And because of the lagged relationships that is in the experiment, it's actually not easy to learn the relationships, you know. And again, this is, a, uh, this is related to Steve's point. Um, and the more they change their investments, the more they jumped around, actually the harder it is for them to see relationships, especially, um, when it's lagged by two periods. So that could be another reason why, you know, they are just less jumpy, you know, in terms of uh, changing their investment. Interesting, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there are other questions, Pia? 
If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Uh, very nice paper. And uh, I just have one question uh, because Adam asked about uh, the effect of HTM, uh, the potential downside of HTM uh, in a low change in environment. Uh, so I was thinking, uh, what about in a high change environment? Because uh, as far as I know, like big banks, they have a whole team or is sometimes like a department dedicated to uh, their model, right? Like, cause uh, they monitor their model and they constantly updating the model. So in that case, uh, do you think in a high change environment, the HTM will offer some extra benefits uh, than like mandatory uh, constant update update to the model. I mean, like, mm -hmm. let's say if the bank you encourage the their team to uh, in, implement like to uh, implement this uh, HTM uh, on top of like the mandatory uh, updating, would you expect the, this to offer some like extra benefits? Maybe like it will help them to identify some. Uh, additional factors outside the model or something else, but uh, I think this yeah. is an int like interesting thing. To so see. I think what you are saying in the context of the ex of the example that you just raised, uh, that would be a setting where people already have a pre-existing model and they are asked, you know, to continuously update or evaluate their model, right? So that will be a setting where it's the mo it, at least when it's mapped to our experiment, it will be a model plus HTM setting, right? And I think, I mean, um, one experiment doesn't do it all, but um, I mean, our experiment suggests at least, you know, in a very hypothetical world that that is an environment where the HTM is, you know, would be most effective, you know, when it's combined with a model. Um, that said, I think, Future research definitely should um, look at, you know, a setting where the, if the environment changes really fast, you know, um, whether our results will still hold. So, you know, honestly, I don't know, you know, because it's, it's um, uh, we really, you know, can't speak too far beyond, you know, the environment that we examine in our study. But I think that's a good, uh, that's a good thing to, 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 to think about. And like Adam, uh, said earlier on um, that, you know, this idea that HTM is bad or could be potentially bad, that's definitely something, you know, to think about. Because we're always constantly asked, right, to, um, you, know, it, you know, especially in fast moving industries, we're constantly being asked, you know, oh, you gotta, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta be on your feet, you know, you gotta think whether, you know, there could be changes. In, and so maybe, maybe that is bad, you know, in certain settings. Thank you. Thank you uh, Prof Professor Stephen. I'd like to get back to the motivation for the paper. Now, many years ago, Bill Taylor did his dissertation presentation at the uh, AAA. And I uh, blurted that, you know, while it may be okay at Cornell to have one measure per category in a balanced scorecard, uh, you, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily agree that that's what a balanced scorecard looks like four quadrants with one measure a quadrant. Mm -hmm. Now, when I bring this to your paper, we're now in one measure and one quadrant. Uh, and so I'm having a hard time relating all the emphasis on balanced scorecard papers early in your setup and what this shows uh, about uh, the, what the experiment actually shows about balanced scorecard. And so I, 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 I have a tough time uh, linking the cited literature uh, to uh, the actual experiment. That doesn't change the fact that the experiment is neat in its 
examining something interesting, but what in the heck does it have to do with the balanced scorecard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I hear you. I think when when I um, you know when I uh, submitted my dissertation to uh, Carr, and I, I remember you are the editor for that, <laughs> and I think one of the the issues that I grapple with with uh, motivating causal models. And in that my dissertation, the causal model was also extremely simple. It doesn't, in fact, it's not, you know, one can may even say, like you say, it's not even a causal model per se in the context of balanced scorecard. And I had tried, tried to walk back, you know, the degree of references uh, to balanced scorecard. Um, but anyway, in response to your question, I think the reason why we did that was because, you know, um, well, at least, you know, all three of us in the co-author team believe that, you know, that's one context where causal model is used, you know, and uh, clearly, I'm in agreement with you that I think that the causal models that is used in the real world is a lot more complex with a lot more met metrics in each uh, um, perspective. So I think it will be interesting to, and I think you, you had a was it you that had a study that, or maybe it was not someone else, that had a study that looked at, you know, when you have all this, you know, multiple, when you have too many metrics, I think that that could be problematic too within one uh, perspective. Uh, can I just uh, summarize what I heard, uh, which was, it doesn't have anything to do with the balanced scorecard? I don't think so. I think it does. I think the balanced scorecard is a much more complex causal model. Marlis? Hi, Kim. Um, my comment was just that uh, I, I haven't read the paper, so I don't know all you know the ins and outs of the details there. But as you were talking, it seemed like there were several questions about um you know how much change there really was in people's investments from the pre-post the post the ex-post <laughs> that's not the right word right. the post change period and so on and um it seemed to me like uh, an interest uh, there's been some interest in that variation in their investment strategies so um, to the extent that you have a spot where you can include the variability of investment in area two, for example, or just pick two, um, two and three, or whatever it is you think of. I think that's an interesting thing to know how much there is um, mucking around, as you called it, how much there is in, in trying different strategies and so forth based on the HTMQ versus not. So um, I realize that it should get us kind of the same information in a sense about how well these things are affecting people's um, judgments and so on. But I think that that's a direct measure that's of interest. So if you can yeah. get it in there somewhere, even if it's footnoted or an appendix, I think that there'd be a lot of people interested. Yeah, we have um, we have put it in in a appendix, you know, and it was just it got so long because mm. you know we, we were testing all the different variances and so that was the reason why we're having difficulty condensing the uh the implications of that i mean generally it's it like i mentioned uh during the presentation or the, in response to one of the questions it does show um that there is more variability uh when more variance in the investments when there's htm and the model does reduce that variance so having a model does reduce that variance, but it was just there were just so many metrics, you know, across, and, and it just became messy. But it was in an in appendix, and um, now the the challenge is condensing. Yeah, I wonder if you could just give us some descriptive statistics, even you know, just even the the variance in each of the four cells or something. Um, right. Even right. if it's overall, and I mean, it's not great detail, it's not big tests, but I, I think it's right. just an interesting enough area that we might want to know at least the um, basics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I, I completely agree with you. I think we, we um, that's a good suggestion. Just, you know, um, showing just the, just the raw, almost just the raw descriptives, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It can, no, it can I, be pretty terse. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. agree with you. Thank you. Uh, there are another questions. 
thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Kim, uh, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent uh, paper and excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's yeah. all uh, that remains for me to say is the thank you, everyone that's joined us. And uh, I thank you very much for taking the time. I want to present it to us today, dear Professor Kim. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.